continuing with section 1.1 and moving on to symmetry groups. We'll have as a definition uh, of a symmetry group on any set. So let S be any non-empty set and A of S, the set of all bijections from S to S. Then A of S forms a group under function composition and we're not restricting this to finite sets. Bijection, simply a one-to-one -one and onto mapping, surjective and injective mapping of set S into itself. Uh, you're probably most familiar with this in the setting of dealing with uh, S as a finite set in the, the classical senior level algebra symmetry groups. But we can consider symmetry groups uh, that, aren't in, that aren't finite as well. On any non-empty set, we can consider a symmetry group. So we're claiming that uh, A of S forms a group under fun function composition. Uh, again, not terribly surprising. Um, of course, there's an identity, the identity bijection, the identity mapping on set S to itself. Uh, being a bijection, we have inverses for any mapping, there's an inverse mapping and function composition is associative. So follows quite easily that in fact, we do have a group in the event that S is the symbols one through N say, then A of S is the symmetric group on N letters denoted S sub N. In general, we just call this a group of permutations on set S, but in your senior level algebra class and probably primarily in this class as well, when this comes up, it'll come up in the setting of, of finite groups and symmetric groups on N letters, these groups S sub N. Uh, the order of S sub N is in factorial as to be shown in uh, one of the exercises in the section. So once we've got symmetry groups established, we can look at, but we haven't formally defined this just yet, we can look at um, subgroups of these groups uh, and the dihedral groups are actually subgroups of the symmetry groups. Um, we'll often um, denote elements of S sub N, the symmetry group, uh, as uh, representing the permutations with a two by N matrix. So if we take set S to be one through N, then we'll list out a matrix style, uh, the elements uh, one through N, and then their images under permutation alpha. So we'll have uh, one through N written on the top. The bottom is one through N as well, just in some different order, however they're permuted around in such a way symbolically here that alpha of K, the permutation applied to element K produces I sub K. So we get some I sub K out down here. Uh, we can then deal with mappings, um, products of these mappings, products of these permutations as follows. So we're gonna represent uh, say two permutations in S4, so we'll get the symbols one through four, say the sigma permutation maps one to three, maps two to one, maps three to two, fixes four. The tau permutation maps one to four, two to one, three to two, and four to three is given. So we wanna see how to multiply these together. Now we wanna think of these permutations sort of is acting on the set S. They do things to the, el to the elements of set S. Um, as such, we're gonna deal with products sigma times tau by reading these from uh, right to left, as is the standard in uh, the Fraley book that I so frequently refer to, it's not universally standard though. So you're thinking in a sense that uh, if we look at sigma tau, we have sigma tau acting on set S. So I kind of think is function composition, we'll have sigma of tau of the elements of set S. So punchline is we're reading these from right to left. Okay, so if we took these two permutations, sigma times tau, here they are. We're not going to do this, of course, in terms of any sort of matrix multiplication. The dimensions don't even support that, but we'll read it as follows. I wanna see in the product permutation, sigma times tau, 
where does one get mapped? Well, under tau, one is mapped to four, first off. Next, sigma takes four, maps it to itself, fixes four. So ultimately, one is mapped to four and then mapped to four. One is mapped to four. More interesting, two is mapped to one by tau, and one is mapped to three by sigma. So ultimately, two is mapped through one to three. Two is mapped to three in the product of those permutations. Three is mapped to two under tau. Two is mapped to one under sigma. So three is mapped to one under the product. Four to three, three to two, four is mapped to two under the product. If we reverse the order, then we don't get the same thing. These are not uh, commutative in these compositions of these permutations. Um, tau sigma produces this permutation here. Uh, we've got one mapped to two under tau sigma and under sigma tau one is mapped to four. So that's enough to show they're, they're not the same. So uh, the group of all these permutations on the elements one through four, the symmetric group uh, on elements one through four, uh, is not a Nabelian group. Uh, there's a product of two elements of S sub four, which are different. Sigma times tau does not equal tau times sigma. We don't have commutivity. In fact, that's the case, as you know, from your senior level algebra. That's the case with any of the um, symmetry groups, uh, S sub n for n greater than or equal to three. Yeah, not entirely universal to read uh, this from, from right to left, but it is the notation that Fraley uses. Uh, when we talk permutations, which hands-on we won't do a great deal of, but when we do, we'll, we'll interpret it in the same style that Fraley does. Uh, one way to define new groups from existing groups is to define a direct product. So let G and H be multiplicative groups. Being a multiplicative group simply means we represent the binary operation using multiplicative notation. Define the direct product of G and H as Cartesian product of the uh, elements of G with the elements of H to give us ordered pairs here. So the direct product of two groups has as its elements ordered pairs of elements of groups, group G and group H in this case. And so we need to define a binary operation on those ordered pairs. So if we take GH, the ordered pair, times G prime H prime, the ordered pair, we'll define that to be the ordered pair consisting of G, G prime, comma, H, H prime. So ordered pairs, binary operation, produce ordered pairs. Uh, were the G and H groups additive, then we would refer to this as a direct sum and use a different notation. And uh, fairly straightforward to show that um, if G and H are groups, then uh, the direct product G times H is a group, as is the direct sum G plus H in the additive setting. Uh, the identities, by the way, if they're uh, E sub G and E sub H, I need two of them because we've got two groups here, then the identity and the direct product is the ordered pair E sub G, E sub H. For G, H and the uh, direct product, the inverse of that ordered pair is the ordered pair of the inverses. Pretty straightforward, pretty elementary how these ordered pairs interact. So there's a way to build new groups from existing groups. Uh, strictly speaking, what we have as examples of groups so far is pretty limited. Uh, something we will do in section 1.4 is consider cosets and quotient groups. Uh, to do so, we'll approach it from um, a perspective of dealing with equivalence relations with respect to elements of the groups. So in the following, we'll introduce an equivalence relation on, we'll do it in a, in a general setting instead of groups, we'll do it actually on monoids. Uh, and we're gonna use the equivalence classes of these equivalence relations to set up some new kind of groups, ultimately leading us to quotient groups. So take R, uh, a relation represented by tilde. So tilde is a symbol we'll use. Uh, this notation here, simply R is the name of the relation and tilde is a symbol we'll use for it. So let tilde be an equivalence relation on a monoid G. 
that satisfies whenever A1 is related to A2 and B1 is related to B2, and we're in the setting of a monoid, that is a, a group, except we may not have inverses, that implies that A1 times B1 is related to A2 times B2, or equivalent, if you like. Uh, such an equivalence relation where we get these conditions satisfied for all elements of uh, the group G, sorry, the monoid G. Such an equivalence relation is called a congruence relation. And when we have congruence relations, we're about to claim we can make groups out of the equivalence classes. So the claim is uh, the set G mod R, I'm going to read this G mod R because uh, really modular arithmetic will be our standard example of this kind of behavior. But I'll read this uh, G mod R. G is the monoid. R is uh, the relation. So actually, we'll take it to be equivalence classes most of the time. The set G mod R of all equivalence classes of G under R is a monoid itself under the binary operation defined by here we're letting X bar denote the equivalence class containing X, so we're saying the equivalence class containing A times the equivalence class containing B is by definition the equivalence class containing AB. So we're using the operation in the monoid G right here when we multiply A and B together, and we're defining a binary operation right here. We're defining a binary operation on this thing, the set of equivalence classes. And the claim is, uh, is a monoid. So this definition of a binary operation produces a monoid on the equivalence classes, a monoid whose elements are equivalence classes. And in addition, if G is a group, uh, then so is G mod R. If G is a billion, then so is G mod R. Of course, we'll primarily use this in the setting of groups. So let's look at a proof of that. Okay, so uh, we'll take equivalence relations and show that equivalence classes form, forms first a monoid and secondly forms uh, a group and an abelian group with additional hypotheses. Okay, uh, one of the main reasons we look at equivalence classes is equivalence classes partition a set on which the equivalence relation is defined. Uh, equivalence relations partition the set into equivalence classes. So we can take all the equivalence classes, they're pairwise disjoint, and they partition the set on which they're defined. In this case, it's monoid G on which they're defined. If equivalence class A1 equals equivalence class containing element A2 and equivalence class containing B1 equals equivalence class containing B2, then we've got A1 and A2 are similar, related, equivalent, and B1 and B2 are related, B1 and B2 are equivalent. So by hypothesis, we have uh, A1B1 to be similar to A2B2, equivalent, if you like, um, because we assumed we had a congruence relation, right? So that's this part here. Now, the way we've defined uh, multiplication of equivalence classes is effectively in terms of representatives. So if we've got A1 equivalent to A1B1 equivalent to A2B2, then we have A1B1 and A2B2 in the same equivalence class. In other words, we get this collection of symbols. Remember the overlining simply means the equivalence class containing whatever elements we have down here. So we get this relationship between the equivalence classes so the binary operation on the collection of equivalence classes is well-defined. That is, if we want to multiply equivalence class um, A1 times equivalence class uh, B1, we can choose any representative of this equivalence class we like. We could choose A1 or A2 for that matter. Over here, we could choose B1 or B2 if you like, any representative from these equivalence classes, and it produces the same output equivalence class. The equivalence class containing A1 and B1 is the same as the equivalence class containing A2, B2. So we'll take um, 
the binary operation and compute the equivalence classes using representatives is what it's called. And it's well defined. It's independent of the representatives you choose. All right. So we do have a binary operation, well defined. Now we need to worry about a uh, semi-group. Do we have associativity? Uh, monoid, do we have an identity? And when we enter the group stuff, do we have inverses? And when we enter the billion group stuff, do we have commutivity? Okay, so let's look at uh, the product of the equivalence class containing A times the product of equivalence classes containing B and C. So what we'll do is simply move the conversation from the collection of equivalence classes to uh, the monoid itself where we know we've got associativity. Okay, what do you mean by the equivalence class containing B times the equivalence class containing C? Well, we've defined the product of equivalence classes in such a way that that is the equivalence class containing the product B and C. Definition of product of equivalence classes was use representatives. So use B and C as representatives. Now we've got a product again of two equivalence classes, the equivalence class containing A and the equivalence class containing BC. How do you define the product of equivalence classes? As the equivalent class of the product using representatives. So we'll take A times BC. So all this stuff here is occurring in the monoid and we'll take the equivalence class containing that. That's how you multiply equivalence classes together by definition. All right, we're trying to establish associativity. We know we've got associativity in G, G was a monoid. Actually, all I need is a semi-group for this part. Uh, but we had associativity within structure G itself. So use the associativity on the elements down here and now peel it apart. We've got um, an equivalence group of a product, sorry, equivalence class of a product by the definition of product of equivalence classes. That's the equivalence class of the first in that product times the equivalence class of the second. So that allows us to break this up as a product of equivalence classes, do it again in this AB equivalence class to get equivalence class containing A times equivalence class containing B. Definition of how you multiply equivalence classes together again. And indeed, we've got the equivalence class containing A times the product of the equivalence class containing B times equivalence class containing C equals this. We've got the associativity on the equivalence classes. So we've got an associative binary operation on this G mod R thing. It's a semi-group. So it has a binary operation and that binary operation is associative. That's what a semi-group is. What's up with identities? I'm actually claimed it was a monoid. Let E be the identity of the monoid G and consider the equivalence class containing E. If we take the equivalence class containing A times the equivalence class containing E, then kind of similar to what we just had, we get the following. Um, we get the equivalence class containing A times E. That's how you multiply equivalence classes together. A times E, looking at the product of the two elements of algebraic structure G, not the equivalence classes. A times E is A itself. So we'll make that substitution. E is, say, uh, an identity, because we're considering a right identity. Uh, since we've multiplied on the right, we'll move it to the left here shortly. Uh, but we get um, equivalence class containing A. So that's half of the story right there. Equivalence class containing A times equivalence class containing the identity equals the equivalence class containing A. So we've just shown this thing here, the equivalence class containing E, is a right identity. Since the this is an arbitrary element of G mod R. Now let's uh, go through it and introduce the identity again, but this time on the left. A is the same as the identity times A. B is a left identity as well, left and right identity. Uh, and then break that up using the definition. And we've got exactly what we need to say uh, that uh, e equivalence class containing E is the identity in this algebraic structure, the G mod R, the collection of equivalence classes. 
equivalence class containing A times equivalence class containing the identity is equivalence class containing A. And same thing if we have them in the opposite order. So that's the reason we've done it on, on two sides here. So uh, we've got ourselves a uh, um, identity. We've got associativity. Then we have as claimed a monoid. So if G is a monoid, then G mod R is a monoid. If G, uh, G is a semigroup, then we've got G mod R as a semigroup as well. And we're really here to deal with groups, which means we need to deal with inverses. So if G is a group, then any element in G has an inverse, usual notation, multiplicative notation. We just need to confirm that the equivalence class containing A inverse times equivalence class containing A equals the identity in this algebraic structure. This algebraic structure is G mod R, which we know at this stage to be a monoid. So we do know that uh, it has an identity. And this is what the identity is, as established before. And we need to take that product in the opposite direction. So this is quite similar to what we just did. So equivalence class containing A inverse times equivalence class containing A. You ought to have the hang of it by now. How do you multiply those together? by taking the equivalence class of the product, A inverse times A. But A inverse times A is the identity. We're in a nice little group G at this stage. So we get the equivalence class containing the identity. And that is the identity in G mod R, what ultimately we'll call a quotient group with appropriate hypotheses. Um, now, the identity can be written as A times A inverse of course, and then we can split those up using the definition of um, multiplication of equivalence classes. And that's exactly what we need. This thing times this arbitrary element of G mod R equals the identity, reverse the order, also equals the identity. Then this thing, that's the inverse of this particular element of G mod R. So we've got associativity of the binary operation, We've got um, an identity element, the equivalence class containing the identity of G, and we've got inverses. And the inverses were kind of the obvious thing. The inverse of the equivalence class containing A is the equivalence class containing A inverse, provided G's a group. All right, so uh, we're using congruence relations to define a new group, something we'll ultimately call a, um, a quotient group. The equivalence relation will be particular to uh, the setting when we do quotient groups, but that's to come in, I think it was section four. So um, the equivalence classes of a congruence relation form a group. Final claim was if the group G is a billion, then so is uh, the group of equivalence classes. Okay. Uh, if G is a billion, then A times B equals B times A. So we need to show the Equivalence class containing A times equivalence class containing B is the same as this product here. We get commutivity in the multiplication of the equivalence classes, piece of cake. Take the product of the equivalence classes, use your definition for that multiplication to change the setting so you can have a conversation about group elements, G. So we got uh, A and B in group G. Group G is a billion, so A times B is the same as B times A. Split them up using the definition of how you multiply these equivalence classes, and there's your commutivity. So if G is a billion, then G mod R is also a billion. Okay, so that conversation comes a little bit out of the blue, uh, but we're foreshadowing some things that will happen later uh, when we look at quotient groups. And we'll approach quotient groups uh, in terms of equivalence relations and normal subgroups. You've seen normal subgroups before, I'm sure. Uh, but we'll actually approach it in terms of equivalence relations, which will be related to normal subgroups. Uh, you're certainly familiar, probably before you encounter modern algebra, um, with uh, A is congruent to B mod M, with just uh, modular arithmetic. So probably the most familiar equivalence relation you've seen is that of equivalence modulo m on the integers. That is, we'll say uh, a is, is equivalent to b, a is related to b, uh, if and only if uh, a is congruent to b mod m. 
That allows us to uh, take the integers and partition them up into equivalence classes. And those equivalence classes are represented as Z mod M, the uh, integers mod M. So we'll let Z mod M uh, be the set of equivalence classes resulting from this particular equivalence relation up here, or some given M, we do this. And that will produce Z mod M having the equivalence classes, zero bar, one bar, up to M minus one bar. So all these things are equivalence classes. Uh, strictly speaking, I, maybe you did this in senior level algebra, but I really wouldn't want to use a symbol zero through M minus one. It's, it's a little unclear of the context there. So in this class, we'll be pretty careful to indicate when we're looking at the modular arithmetic, the zero symbol will not be something we consider to be an element of Z mod M. It's an integer, it's zero. If I'm in an additive group, I might use zero to indicate the identity. But here, this comes about in a particular way using congruence relations, this, this congruence relation up here. And uh, so we get elements that aren't integers, they're equivalence classes of integers. So I'll emphasize the, the bars, the overlines, uh, quite a bit in this stuff, just to distinguish it from the straight up integers. These are not integers, these are equivalence classes of integers. Integers add in a particular way. Equivalence classes of integers add in a different way. Uh, Z sub M is an additive abelian group of order M. Uh, in fact, we'll look at cyclic groups soon. It's a classic example of a cyclic group, finite cyclic group. Uh, if we take uh, a prime P, Z sub P, uh, removing the zero bar element forms a multiplicative group, a multiplicative group uh, of order P minus one where P is prime, that's one of the exercises as well, where, uh, strictly speaking, we need to define what we mean by the multiplication of um, two elements, I'm sorry, multiplication of two equivalence classes. We would mean multiply two equivalence classes by multiplying two representatives of those equivalence classes, just like we did with the addition. That is multiply and reduce mod M more tangibly. Uh, another useful example of a group which involves equivalence classes is based on um, a relation on the rationals. We'll say uh, A and B rational numbers are equivalent, are related, uh, if and only if A minus B is an integer. Uh, this is considered in one of the exercises in this section as well, exercise A. We know uh, if we have a congruence relation that's what you're just showing exercise A. If we have a congruence relation, then we can look at the equivalence classes under that congruence relation and they'll form a group. That's what theorem five said. So in other words, Q mod Z, as I will read it, Q mod Z forms an additive group where we take one equivalence class plus another equivalence class and define that sum to be the equivalence class of A plus B. Same thing we did in theorem 1.1.5, except uh, this is an additive notation instead of multiplicative notation. We have products there, we've got sums here. It's just a binary operation. Uh, this is called a group of rationals, modulo one. Uh, an important group in the theory of infinite abelian groups is something called a proofer group. Uh, it's explored in uh, exercise 10, it's denoted Z of P infinity. Uh, it's a subgroup of um, this particular group, uh, Q mod Z. And uh, how many properties did we give? Uh, additive group, yeah, it's an abelian group as well. Of course, all this addition of uh, rationals and addition of integers, everything in sight is um, commutative. So we've, we're dealing with an abelian group here as well. So this so-called proofer group that pops up in one of the exercises, it's a subgroup of the uh, rationals mod Z. Okay, we're going to look into some uh, sort of technicalities uh, at this stage, maybe that you didn't even think to explore in senior level algebra. We want to put a meaning on 
for elements A1 through A sub n of group G. What does A1 times A2 blah, blah, blah times A sub n mean? What does it mean to multiply n elements of a group together? See, the problem is groups have binary operations. So it's well defined what it means to multiply two things together at a time. What's it mean to multiply n things together at a time? Well, that's what we're going to dig into the details of. So welcome to a graduate algebra class, much more rigor and much more detail. But starting with a binary operation, it's just that deals with multiplying two elements at a time together. Uh, if we had three elements, and this sort of foreshadows how we'll approach more elements, if we had three elements, A1, A2, and A3, you know, binary operation, I can multiply the first two together, Okay, that gives us a, an element of the group. And then we could multiply that element of the group times a sub three. Yeah, but by associativity, we also could have multiplied the second two together, creating an element of the group, and then multiply that element of the group by a one is given. The thing is the binary operation only works on two elements at a time. Well, as long as we preserve the order, uh, I can multiply them together in uh, pairwise any order I wanted, apparently, when there's three of them. Yeah, associativity guarantees that. And of course, associativity will guarantee any amount of pairing could be done. No, I'm not talking commutivity, talking pairing uh, and multiplying things together two at a time. Uh, but with many elements, more than three, it's not obvious that different groupings don't yield different results for the product. It, it doesn't. Uh, we'd expect associativity to be helpful in this, and, and it is. But these are some details we need to iron out in a class at this level. Okay, so we're going to define something called a um, meaningful product. Uh, we're going to this setting of semi-group because this really just uh, requires associativity. So we don't need an identity or inverses in this conversation. Of course, this holds in groups as well. So the definition is uh, given any sequence of elements of a semi-group, say A1 through A sub n, a meaningful product of those elements, A1 through A sub n, in this order, I'm not, not addressing any commutivity stuff. So the ordering stays the same. So the indices indicate the order of these things. When n equals one, we define the product to be a sub one. It's just a sub one by itself, a sub one times nothing else. If n is greater than one, then define a meaningful product to be any product of the form a one through a sub m times a sub n plus one through a sub n, where m is less than n, and a1 through a sub m, and a n plus one through a sub n are themselves meaningful products of m and n minus m elements, respectively. All right. We need to show this any product thing is independent of the choice of m. And that's what our, our result will be, and we'll prove it using induction. So the idea is um, meaningful products are established when M is small. I don't know if I say M is small, maybe when N is small. Uh, we've got meaningful products when N equals uh, one, by definition. When N equals two, there's nothing to associate. When N equals three, by associativity, we've got meaningful products. Uh, so we'll inductively have these other meaningful products defined. So we will have defined what it means to multiply A1 through A sub M. We'll define what it means to multiply these things together. That being done, then we'll define the meaningful product of A1 through A sub N as the product of these M times the product of these uh, N minus M elements. Throughout, you're just multiplying together two things at a time. This first thing, which has been dealt with inductively in some sort of meaningful product style, and this second thing. So you're simply multiplying these two parenthetic elements of the semi-group together. Okay, but 
it says any product of this form. So that allows you maybe to um, multiply the first one times all the last ones when m equals one, or multiply um, all but the last one together when m equals n minus one, and then multiply the last one. This different approach we need to show doesn't produce different group elements. So that'll be the theorem to be shown. We need a, another definition. This will be done in terms of induction. We need the strong principle of mathematical induction to show that this meaningful product stuff given up here actually is well defined. Uh, Hungerford refers to the recursion theorem uh, in a footnote in this conversation. Uh, the recursion theorem is just, just basic mathematical induction as well. Okay, so we're gonna define something called a standard n product. And if you were to speculate how you might define a product of n things, this is probably what you'd guess. So we're defining the standard n product of elements from semigroup G A1 through A sub n as follows. So it's done um, recursively. The standard n product, product from one to n of a sub i of these elements, that is a one times a two times da, 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 through a sub n is defined as when n equals one, it's simply the, the single element you get. When n is greater than one, the standard product from i equals one to n of a sub i is defined as the standard product from i equals one to n minus one of a sub i times a sub n. So this gives a recursive way to define this standard product thing. What we need to show is this standard product thing agrees with this meaningful product thing earlier. And it does. So we'll only need um, the principle of mathematical induction, if you like, Hungerford's um, uh, recursion theorem theorem 3.62. We'll just stick with a, an inductive proof on this one as it's equivalent logically. Uh, and in the following, let's see, following result shows that meaningful products are the uh, proper way to unambiguously define the product of several elements of a group. We're going to show that any two meaningful products are equal. So it's independent of the choice of that parameter M because we're gonna show they equal the standard product. In what follows this symbol, this pi symbol will be used to represent the standard N product. This thing we defined up here recursively. So when we define or when we use the symbol with a pi, it indicates this thing here. And this is defined for any number, any finite collection of elements in a group. Okay, so the theorem claims uh, for A1 through A sub n from a semigroup, again, we don't need um, identities or inverses in this conversation, so they go for the weakest hypotheses, but of course this holds for groups as well. Any two meaningful products of uh, a1 through a sub n uh, retain the order are equal so we'll just use induction on n the number of those elements uh, we'll show that any meaningful product is equal to the standard n product the, the pi notation that we had introduced uh, certainly this is true for n equals one by definition it's true for n equals two uh, quite clearly, A1 times A2, I mean, there's, there's nothing much to do with that. Uh, even when N equals three, we get it by regular old associativity as we argued earlier, but we'll take N simply to be greater than two, greater than three would, would make sense in what we're gonna do, but we'll take N to be greater than two, this is how the book approaches it. Then, by definition, the product of A sub one through A sub N is the product of A sub one through A sub N times the product of a sub n plus one through a sub n, where the, the m is an arbitrary number between one and, and n minus one. So this is how we've dealt with the meaningful products. Now, suppose we've established that the standard product 
as defined recursively, represents the product of A1, say, through A sub K. K is less than or equal to N. Uh, here we're dealing with, if we have N things, M is assumed to be at least one. So this involves a product of less than um, or equal to, or well, strictly less than, it looks like the way we set it up. Now we're gonna go to N plus one. When we look at a product of N plus one things, here we've got at least one and at most N. Here we've got at least one and at most N as well. So we'll be able to use the induction hypothesis on those. So here comes the induction hypothesis. Suppose we've established that a product of K things is given by the standard product of those K things, which is defined recursively, and this holds for K less than or equal to N. And then we'll consider K equals N plus one. So here comes the induction step. All right, so when we take a product, A1 through A sub N plus one, the meaningful product says that we could write in terms of a product of the first M times a product of the last, uh, what, N plus one minus M, the, the last bunch of them. By the definition of the meaningful product, we get this relationship here. By the induction hypothesis, let's go back actually, as observed, the induction hypothesis applies to M things and applies to however many things there are here. There's um, at least one in each of these. So there's at most N in either of these as well. And when we have at most N, we can rewrite these products in terms of standard products. So we'll take these and write them as a standard product. And we'll take these and write them as a standard product. And that's what we've done next based on the induction hypothesis. Uh, the first bunch of them were um, M in size. The second bunch of them were N plus one minus M. M is at least one. So uh, over here in the second collection, we had um, at most N. So we're good on the induction hypothesis to write these as products, standard products of this form. All right, how did you define standard products? Recursively. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna peel off the very last one of these. So we're gonna peel off um, the last of these. The, the last is when we have um, I equal to N plus one minus M. When you plug that in for I, that subscript becomes N plus one. You know, N plus one was the last one. Just had to tweak the indices a little bit to get it expressed in the proper form. But we're gonna peel the last one off from this second product. Uh, why can you do that? Well, let's... That's the recursion part of the definition of a standard product, that the product of this collection of things is the product of one less times the rightmost thing order matters. So we can write it in terms of a product of three things. Well, that's nice. We've got this element of the, uh, what, semigroup, this element of the semigroup and an a sub n plus one. Three things in a semigroup, we've got associativity. So we can associate these first two together, all right, associate the first two together. Then we've got the a sub n plus one over on the side. So now we've got a product of two standard products, one to n, one to n minus m. We've assumed in our induction hypothesis that when we have such a product involving standard products, that we can simply write that as a product from one to n minus m, uh, no, excuse me, product from one to n, right? I've, I've tweaked the indices on the rightmost. When we have n things multiplied together here, the induction hypothesis said, what you get from this would be uh, a meaningful product written out. And we've assumed that meaningful products are represented by um, the standard products when we have few enough and we do have few enough, we've got n, total of n elements involved here. We've got the a sub n plus one, on the right, so all this was just justifying pulling the last term off and isolating the rest of the product. Well, what happens when you have a standard product, one through n, and you add another thing on the right? Well, given the recursive nature of the standard product, that can be written as a product from one to n plus one of a sub i, given the recursive nature, the definition of the standard product. 
So we can uh, absorb that rightmost term in this product. And what we've shown is we took a product of a sub one through a sub n plus one, translated it into for an arbitrary m, appropriate size, a uh, product of two meaningful products, and we're led to this unambiguously defined standard product. So in other words, any two meaningful products yields uh, the same product. It yields the standard n product or standard n plus one product since we had n plus one things here. And we've got the result to hold for k equals n plus one. So there's your induction step from a product of n things to n plus one things. So in general, for any natural number n, uh, the meaningful product that is uh, pair up things and uh, uh, product of M of these terms and then the product of the remainder of these terms, any meaningful product yields the standard end product. So we're good to go and unambiguously talk about the product of N elements as uh, it's not written out specifically here. Let's return to the notes. We can talk about any product of n elements simply as the symbols um, a1 times a2. Got a clean place to stay. There we go. Back a couple of pages. a1 times a2, blah, 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 through a sub n. I don't need to go through and smother this thing with enough parentheses to make sure I'm only multiplying two things together at a time. If we had three elements, all those parentheses, there's only two choices. If we had four elements, uh, I'm not sure how many they'd be. We need have parentheses all over the place in terms of pairing things together. It's a little complicated counting argument because, uh, well, I, I am stuck with the same ordering. We didn't make any comments about um, commutivity. But we don't need to put parentheses around everything, even though we have a binary operation and force it to deal with two elements at a time. We've unambiguously, thanks to theorem 1.1.6, we've unambiguously got the product of A1 through A sub n in that order defined. Uh, preferably defined like this in terms of this standard end product is what we showed it equals. Um, Yeah, I don't have to insert parentheses. Hey, uh, what about commutivity? Strictly speaking, I know I can reverse the order of uh, two things in a product. Binary operation, A star B equals B star A when we've got commutivity, when we've got a group, an abelian group. Uh, what if I have a product of a whole bunch of things? Well, let's not do it in detail. But there's no surprise. If we have um, in a commutative, well, I guess I'll stick with a semigroup, commutative semigroup, uh, yeah, this just relates to the um, associativity is what we need and commutivity now. If we take elements A1 through A sub n and we multiply them together, you can permute that ordering any way you like if you've got commutivity. In other words, A1, A2 through A sub n equals the product of those same elements in any order. They've got this I sub one, I sub two through I sub n. What these represent is uh, a permutation of the elements one through n. So in other words, you can pick any one to be the first one, any one to be the second one and so forth. So a similar type argument would go through and show, yeah, you, you got commutivity, you multiply n things together, you can swap them around in any order you want. How are you gonna prove this? Yeah, it'll be induction as well. A uh, little notation, uh, this will come up, especially in when we consider cyclic groups. Uh, if we repeatedly apply a binary operation to a single element, for example, if we take A times A times A times A, then uh, we'll have a notation for that. Of course, if it's a multiplicative group, we'll use exponents. So. Uh, that G be a multiplicative semigroup and A an element of G and N a natural number. Little comment here. Um, I think this is consistent with a notation of um, Hungerford. In analysis, the natural numbers normally start with one. Um, in calculus, the natural numbers normally start with one. 
Uh, in some settings, the natural numbers start with zero. So we need to be on the same page about what we mean in terms of natural numbers. I mean, not sure if Hungerford means or not, maybe Hungerford includes zero. I mean, uh, natural numbers start at one. So when I say natural number, I'm excluding zero. Sometimes I'll need to include zero, so I have to manually do it. You go around including zero as a natural number. Well, sometimes you're going to want to exclude it, so you have to manually do that. So six of one, half a dozen of the other. When I say natural numbers, I don't mean zero. I mean one, two, three, I mean positive integers. So when n is a natural number, a positive integer, the element a to the n in a multiplicative group is defined simply to be a times itself, a times a times a, a product from one to n of a sub i, where all of the a sub i's are a itself. Uh, and this is well defined. This is the, the standard n product, if you like. Uh, simply multiply a by itself n times. And when doing so, we'll indicate that as uh, a to the n power. Quick little observation, if we were in an additive group, we'd take that in to be a coefficient and to note a plus a plus a n times with these symbols. That's a little scary there because if we're in an additive group, you don't multiply. I might even read this as n times a, but that's not nothing involving the group operation. The group operation is addition. It means it's shorthand notation for a plus a plus a plus a n times as this is shorthand notation for a times a times a n times. So beware, we may use symbols like this, especially in the additive groups, uh, even in the group up here, there's, there's no such thing as exponentiation in a group. There's repeated multiplication in multiplicative groups. There's repeated addition in uh, additive groups. If we wanna have an exponent of zero, if G is a monoid, so now I need an identity, a to the zero will be used to represent the identity element. Down here in an additive group, zero times a would be used to represent um, the additive identity in an additive group. Uh, if G is a group and we have inverses, then for any natural number n, any um, positive integer, We'll define a to the negative n, so this is a to a negative integer power, is defined to be the multiplicative inverse of a to the n power. So it's, all we have is one little binary operation. There is no exponentiation, there is no reciprocals, there's just a binary operation. And we're repeatedly using that binary operation. This is just shorthand notation for multiplicative inverses in the multiplicative group setting. Uh, if we were in an additive group and n was a natural number, um, negative n times a would mean the additive inverse of a plus the additive inverse of a plus the additive inverse of a n times. Uh, notation uh, that'll be quite handy on down the road uh, an unsurprising result concerning that notation is the following. If we take in a multiplicative group, uh, a, if you will, to the n power times a to the n power, then we get a to the n plus m power. If we're in a group, then we could allow these m's and n's to be negative. So we, m and n could be any integers if we're in a group. If you're not in a group, you're only in a semi-group, then you better keep it with a positive integers, what I call natural numbers. If you're in a monoid, then you can throw zero in. And so respectively with these restrictions on those exponents. If we were in an additive group, then I'd say something along the lines of, um, if excuse me, m times a plus n times a equals n plus n times a. But there's no times in an additive group. It's shorthand notation and bad verbally. But what are you going to do? It's, it's shorthand for repeated use of the additive binary operation. Uh, so these aren't in the least bit surprising. And um, if we have uh, a to the m itself to the n power, power, there's not really powers. I need to get over that a little bit. Then what we'll get is a to the m n power. 
additively speaking, if we had m times element a, so we took whatever that is, that is a plus a plus a m times, and added it to itself n times, ultimately we'd end up with m times n copies of a, a plus a plus a m n times is the specific meaning of that. So there's a little bit of notation. Um, here's some things we'll take as given, proofs of these, straightforward, tedious. It's not much in the way of graduate algebra to go through and establish these. But uh, that takes care of section 1.1. Uh, we've got groups defined. We've got a very small list of examples of groups. We'll take care of that and head on into uh, section 1.2 now. So have a nice day. I'll see you in section 1.2. Bye-bye.